Thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome to part two of this evening's capstone performance. Um, this evening, the NEH grant KH, KHRCA colloquial series uh, presents our students who will once again take a leading role as they powerfully respond to genocide and injustice through music, poetry, dance, and film. Communication and understanding take many forms, and we developed our project to help students to connect through the creative arts to their everyday coursework and to this difficult material. We really want to thank the administration of our college, led by President Diane Call and Vice President for Institutional Advancement, Rosemary Sullivan Zins, for being strong supporters of all the faculty in our, our search to develop professionally and emotionally. We want to thank Susan Agan, Executive and Artistic Director of QPAC, for helping us with logistics for tonight. John Funky, Technical Director of QPAC, for providing technical support. Our department chairs have helped us a great deal by letting us step outside our, our daily classroom duties and into the realm of personal development with our students. So, we thank Dr. Regina Rochford of Academic Literacy and Dr. Kip Montgomery of the Department of Music. Dr. Arthur Flug is a recently retired uh, director of the Holocaust Center. We thank him very much. And the present director, Dr. Dan Lesham. We thank him very much. Your programs and your catalogs of the art exhibit look so beautiful tonight. Thanks to Susan Fung, uh, graphic designer of the college. I learned to hold for applause in Acting 101. And we thank, and laugh, such as they may be. And we thank James Geezer, copy editor, for helping the program to be correct. Any mistakes that you'll find are mine. We need also to thank the chairs of the English department and the health, physical, education, and dance departments, Dr. David Humphreys and Dr. Young Kim for their support and mentorship of the students who will be reading their poetry for you today and the students who will be dancing their original dance pieces. I want to, and I know Carrie would also, wants to thank Dr. Bjorn Burkhout of the music department for composing original music that you will hear tonight, which is one of the central parts of our performance. And all the members of the faculty cohort who gave so tirelessly helping their students to do what you saw them do and we'll see and hear them do today in tonight's performance. Thank you very much. <laughs> and of course, to all the students who worked so hard these last two semesters. I think what you'll see tonight is Queensboro Community College at its most vibrant, where our academic and cultural institution is featured and uh, where our students are prominently featured and I think that's what makes uh, this evening so special. It's important for me to take time to say thank you Carrie for bringing me on in this project. I'm very thank grateful. You. That was unrehearsed. <laughs> we now ask you to sit back, relax and take in the experiences that you will discover from our students' work. We are blessed tonight to have Motile Chamber Ensemble with us. They are leading scholars in the field of music of the Holocaust and music written by Jewish composers. They are led by Eliza Wadler. Please join me in welcoming Motile Chamber Ensemble. Thank you all for inviting us to Queensborough's Community College's event this evening. We're really proud to be part of it. So the first piece we'll be performing by Egon Ledich. He was a Czech violinist and composer, and he was born in 1889. He was quite a successful violinist from an early age. At the age of 19, he was invited to perform the Sibelius Violin Concerto with the Czech Philharmonic. And then he was asked to be the assistant or second concertmaster of the Czech Philharmonic. So he was very respected and excellent uh, 
violinist, obviously. And in 1939, when the Germans came into Prague in March of 1939, he and most of the Jews were removed from their positions, from their jobs, so he was no longer able to play in the Czech Philharmonic. And without a job, he started to compose probably more than he had been previously because he was busy practicing and performing. And he composed a number of pieces, and one of them is the piece that we're going to perform this evening. So it was actually not uh, composed at Terezin. It was composed a year before he was sent to Terezin. And at Terezin, he was sent there in 1941. It was a concentration camp outside of Prague, and originally it was set up as a transit point for Jews on the way to the death camps in the east, and music was illegal. So when he first arrived at Terezin, you could not perform, you couldn't play your instrument. But soon after, the Germans decided that they would allow it. They would close their eyes and allow the music musicians to perform on their instruments. And Egon Leidich was part of that, that life there. So he did perform, he taught, and he played in a quartet and an orchestra. And uh, later, the Germans actually even encouraged the music to be performed there because they realized they could use the concentration camp as a, as a farce to show the world that um, the Jews were be being treated well, even though everyone knows they were not. It was all a show. So Egon Ledich, um actually had the good fortune. He did not survive. He was sent to Auschwitz in 1944 and immediately sent to the gas chambers. But he had a student at Terezin, and his name was Paul Kling. And I met Paul Kling about 10 years ago in Vancouver. And Paul Kling obviously survived. And I asked Paul Kling, tell me about your teacher, the, the big violinist, Egon Ledich, who you got to study with as a 16-year-old. And he said he was a great violinist. And I remember seeing him in the courtyard at Terezin, this great violinist. And he was performing. Usually a violinist performs with piano accompaniment. But there was no piano. piano. And so Egon Ledich performed with accordion accompaniment. So I always think of when we were playing this piece of this great violinist who was forced to, he was still able to play at least. He played with accordion accompaniment. So I hope you enjoy his quartet Andante. And I want to make a note that uh, Anoush Simonian uh, is not the violist this evening. It's Christina Giles. Thank you.
Four point odd billion numbers and still counting. So I ask this question. Can you fathom something that's never been, or imagine something so complex and so far-fetched even Martin couldn't dream it? This diluted down toxic fairy tale myth, see only a few catch a whiff of my deceitfulness. See, I've been swift moving through the decades. I embark on landscapes making tongues translate peace in the form of war. Any speech or jargon I can manipulate, desecrate a nation in a matter of minutes and let the blood trickle down on those gutter-bound kids. See, I've breathe through gas chambers and watch the remainders drop. I see pyramids rise on the backs of slaves. Any ounce of jealousy or hate sparks in the night's me, from Cain and Abel to Moses in Egypt, from drum beats to heartbeats to feet fleeting. See, I've bellowed out a mean and vicious cry. Only Hitler and a few have heard it. But unlike them, I don't discriminate. You're all subjects to my destruction. So you ask, what is genocide? Simple. It's humanity's most deepest and darkest thoughts, all painted in the blood of millions and still counting.
The composer of the next piece, Robert Dauber, um, was a German uh, composer, cellist, and pianist. And he was just not even 20 when he uh, ended up in Ter Theresienstadt. Um, his father was a well-known salon orchestra director and a very well-known composer. And you'll be able to hear a lot of that um, uh, cabaret uh, feeling in this next serenade. Um, he was uh, at Theresienstadt and participated in the musical activities there and played cello in the opera of Brundabar. And um, I think it's, it's pretty moving to know that this serenade is his only surviving piece. And he um, perished in Theresienstadt when he was not um, even 23 years old. Good evening. Uh, my name is Benjamin Miller. I'm lecturer uh, in the English department here at QCC. Uh, and I'm here to introduce uh, the next item in tonight's program, which is a short film called Moving Through Surveillance, a student collaboration. Uh, the film, uh, it's a result of and a documentary about uh, an interdisciplinary collaboration that took place in the fall semester uh, this past year between three classes, uh, two English classes and a dance class. Um, the film is about nine minutes long. 
Um, and all classes were investigating uh, the Holocaust and issues of the, around the Holocaust and genocide. And uh, more specifically, issues of how, uh, or how complicated issues of surveillance and power intersected with these atrocities. Um, special thanks uh, tonight go out to Carrie Lane um, for including us in tonight's program. Uh, also my collaborators, Professor Elisa Attic and Professor Aviva Gaysmar. Um, and most importantly, all the students who are involved in making the film. Um, Especially uh, two students who cannot be here tonight, uh, Henry Merritt and Daniel Leone. Uh, they couldn't be here tonight, but they came in in January and they edited, they came and edited on multiple days to make sure the project was finished, and I'm grateful to them. Uh, thank you all for your attention. The collaboration features three classes from QCC, an English 101, English 102, and Dance 251 class. All of these classes communicated using Blackboard, an online discussion board. The English 102 class wrote out essays about surveillance and biopowers, touching on personal experiences in which they felt under observation. The Dance 251 class then took these essays and interpreted them into expressive dance. Our job as English 101 is to capture this collaborative assignment. Oh. Well, we were transitioning into a unit on the Holocaust, and I find when I teach that material, it's so abstract for students. They have trouble conceptualizing how such an event took place. So what I wanted to do to open the semester is start with this idea of surveillance, observation, regulation, labeling of people, of bodies, bodies being given an identity based on how they were viewed, um, to show them like this kind of biopolitical mechanism takes place on small scales, on daily scales, in their very own lives. So that when we then went into the history of the Holocaust and the events that led up to it, it wasn't abstract for them anymore. They already understood the nature, how the, this kind of biopolitical process works. Well, I think that surveillance has a lot to do with the Holocaust because in the Holocaust, people, the Jews were, were, were um, tossed into concentration camps and places to be watched, and they were labeled to signify out of a crowd because, you know, everybody looks, looks the same. And to, in order for them to look, look to see who's who, who's different from who. It was a lot less of a leap for them to see how the events in Europe kind of built on themselves sequentially to a more horrifically extreme version of something that they recognize they themselves have experienced. We arrive at the entrance of the neighborhood, we get off the car and I notice everybody on the block looking at us. Since I was five years old, the feeling of having to be in a classroom with my fellow peers has always given me a sense of fear. The basketball team coach and friends didn't see me as a basketball player because of my physical appearance. I began to walk and I started seeing surveillance cameras on every apartment and street light. In the second grade, it was discovered I suffered from four different learning disabilities. But I kept looking straight, pretending like I didn't notice anything. My own teachers would treat me differently or as they would call it, special. My childhood experience made me realize the way observation and surveillance are built into everyday life. This, this is the concept, concept of biopower. Bio my experience traveling through my native country of Ecuador made me realize that surveillance and observation is associated with everyday life. People will continue to harass me and bully me every single day. The students from dance class 251 were given an assignment from Professor Gaysmar to transform a writing piece from English class 102 into a choreographed dance.
working with this English class was pretty interesting. I wasn't expecting, you know, to like have so much like feedback and you know really understand like what they wanted or what type of backgrounds each person had. But uh, I thought it was fun. I thought it was fun. You know, I didn't think it was a little bit challenging, but I I really liked it because I can connect with them. The, the one girl explained like how she was bullied and I couldn't connect with that. I went through the same thing. So it was a really fun practice, uh, practice. but it was, you know, really fun choreographing and really fun like showing it. Like I was glad they were able to see it and connect with it. At first, um, it was difficult because I had to figure out how to incorporate the writing into a piece. But what made it easy for me was the fact that her story related to me. I had a similar, actually very similar. So it was easy for me to bring out that emotion because I actually felt it. I was able to actually dance out and have my own creativity but trying to also portray the story of somebody else so I thought that that was really interesting but it was also hard at the same time because I also wanted to get the essence of what the person was feeling so it was a challenge but I enjoyed it and hopefully you'll be able to do it. performance by the dancing student they did like bits and pieces in the parts that was very interesting for me to see you know those feeling come into like dance movement expression like once I see the dance it was like looking you know like you see a dream you know it was very <laughs> nice feeling uh, this class this class is great I think because everyone supports each other like no one says all oh, your ideas are dumb or you know, everyone really helps each other out and they're like, oh, I like that idea or, oh, I, I want to try your idea, you know. It really helped me really understand that you just don't have to tell a story. You could tell the emotion of the story. It was a frustrating process, but I did learn um, new things and had to basically uh, choreograph and be in someone else's mind and make that story um, come to life for them. Once I understood, like once we talked about different elements in class, it helped me more choreograph something for the work. The idea was that uh, the classes would all collaborate. And what I liked about the project is that each class had its role uh, well defined early on. And um, I'm hoping students in my class gained editing skills, gained communication skills, that all this helped them improve their composition skills. And I think, um, based on reflections at the end, that, that it was a positive experience for most students, and you know, that's a great thing. This project made me feel like QCC was more of a home than it was a uh, school or college. It so felt more personal. This is my first time doing something like this, and I'm actually uh, glad that I'm involved in something like this. I believe people here, they don't value their freedom they have. If you come from other parts of the world and live here, even with the, you know, the issue with the surveillance, even the discrimination you feel, it's maybe half percent of what, what, what's going on on the other side of the world. You know, if someone needs help, you could give them a hand. Know that you're not alone on this. Sure, you may not ex like have experienced it, but you could learn from it and we could actually like, make a difference on it. Everyone deserves to live happily. It, oh. Sorry. It's fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Let's invite special guests for this evening, the children and community members of the Corona Youth Music Project to the stage. And chorus and pop choir, come take your places. And Motil, we invite you too. May I introduce to you uh, Corona Youth Music Project's choir's leader, Ms. Heather Fetro. Thank you so much, Stephen. Good evening. Um, first of all, I want to extend a huge thank you from our group to all of you and the whole team that's put this program together. We're really fortunate to be a part of it this evening. Um, the children who just came on stage are part of the Corona Youth Music Project's Children's Choir. Not only do some of these children sing, but they also take private instrumental lessons as part of the program and participate in a children's orchestra as well. We hope that some of them will go on to play in our youth orchestra. The choir provides a really wonderful starting point for them to learn about musicianship and ear training that we hope will continue to influence their musical development. Corona Youth Music Project was founded in 2010 and its mission is to empower youth to fight poverty, to promote social justice and inclusion through music education and performance. It's actually part of a global movement to affect change through music. And the children's participation in programs like this one tonight becomes a bedrock experience for them. It opens up new horizons for them and possibilities to participate in their community. And as some of them said today, they've made it to college already. So it's pretty exciting for us to be, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it does open up that possibility for them, which can be incredibly wonderful. If you want to learn more about our organization, I encourage you to go onto our website or to check out our Facebook page to learn about how you can become part of this movement. Thank you. The Holocaust is a stunning reminder of the tragic results of prejudice and hate towards other people. But it is also a reminder that hope held firm will eventually reign victorious over the greatest of odds. The following words were inscribed on the walls of a cellar in Cologne, Germany, where Jews were hiding from the Nazis during World War II. Hope was all they had to hold on to. Hope was their only bridge to a brighter tomorrow.
Who used this mic before me? <laughs> Thank you very much, Motil. We'll hear from you in a little bit. Thank you, Queensboro Chorus. We'll hear from you a little bit. And Pop Choir, thank you. But let's feature for a moment the Children of Corona Youth Music Project. Gentlemen, will you help me with these chairs? Never shall I forget. Never shall I forget that first night at camp that turned my life into one long night, seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies I saw burned into Wreaths of smoke in a silent blue sky. Never shall I forget those flames, 
which consumed my faith forever. Never shall I forget that nocturnal silence which deprived me for all eternity my desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. Never shall I forget these things, even if I am condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. Some of you may see the comedy in us moving chairs back that were moved away for no real reason. I thought she was gonna get big and crazy, but she didn't. Queensborough Chorus, you are called to the stage. Motile, you are called to the stage. I can hear them stampeding now. I would like to make a special thanks to Professor Diane Carey of our faculty. She is a member of the faculty of the Department of Speech, Communication, and Theater. She has given her time so selflessly to sing with us in our Queensboro Chorus and our Pop Choir. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Motil means butterfly in Czech. And as the poem is called Butterfly, it is our way of thanking and honoring Motil. The butterfly, the last, the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow. Perhaps if the sun's tears would sing against a white stone. Such, such a yellow is carried lightly way up high. It's sent away, I'm sure, because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. For seven weeks I lived in here, pinned up inside this ghetto, but I have found my people here. The dandelions call to me, and the white chestnut candles in the court. Only I never saw another butterfly. That butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here, in the ghetto. Ani Mamin. Wow. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ani Mamin. Bemuno shelemo, veaf alpi she yis mamema, im kolse animamin. These Hebrew words are one of the central beliefs of the Jewish people. On the train to a concentration camp, a Polish rabbi created a melody, which you are about to hear, to go with these words. Soon, tradition arose that these words were defiantly sung by Jews as they were marched to go to the gas chambers. I believe with complete faith that the Messiah will come, even though he may tarry. Even with all that, I believe. Even with all that, I will wait for him every day for him to come.
Dr. Bjorn Burkhout of our music department has composed, based on this traditional tune, a new piece vividly depicting with the string quartet the defiance and the faith of the Jews as they walked even in the face of death. Please welcome Dr. Bjorn Burkhout.
Gentlemen, now will you help me move the chairs? What faces are they making behind me? I can't see. All right, come ahead. Chorus, please exit. We're done with you for now. Thanks.
Is this my song too? Oh, say, can you see? Our black boys and girls lying on the ground playing dead. If your hands and feet are visible, they won't shoot you. By the dawn's early light, how can you shoot someone who's holding a sandwich? What so proudly we hail, pride cometh before fall. At the twilight's last gleaming, the way that still gleamed the six shots flew with grace and rage and laid out someone's son, brother, friend. He was a criminal, they said. We're so gallantly streaming, tear gas, wooden bullets dived into blackness. Whiteness glared behind protected uniforms and badges. In the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air. Fifty shots. Let's play connect the dots before I say I do. Bells ring, let the games begin. Shots fired, literally. Gave proof through the night. That light drives out darkness. That whites kill our blacks too. They have names, you know. Trayvon Martin, Sean Bell, Ever Garner, Timur Rice. These are only the recent ones. Should clack clack, black cracks. I can't breathe. Cracks when armed white uniform badges shoot in the dark because he feels threatened by the darkness of your skin. The darkness that this was built on. Over the land of the free, free only if. Your skin too dark to be free. Too dark to not enslave. See how big your chain is? Vanity slave. Gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave over the land? How brave, though. Today is Holocaust Remembrance Day, Yom HaShoah. To honor this day, we would like to ask the Holocaust survivors in our audience to please stand and be recognized. John, can you house light? Thank you so much for sharing your testimony with our campus and our community. Uh, we would like to dedicate this last piece of the evening to you. Children, come on stage, please. Chorus, we're ready for you. Motil and Ale, we're ready for you. Uh, pop Choir, we're ready for you. This piece is by Stephen Schwartz, Broadway composer. This was from his first musical, Godspell, written in 1971. Stephen Schwartz is well known as a very successful composer whose musical Witness, I Witness, Wicked recently passed the 2,000 performance mark. It was a lot of performances. 
beautiful city has a message that we share with you. And thank you very much for sharing this evening with us. It's meant a great deal to us. Thank you. Thank you very much again for coming. Thank you very much indeed.